welcome to Unity of Springfield's uh, New Thought and World Religion class, also called our adult education class. Today we have James Masters and he's going to be talking on faith and belief. And before we turn the camera on, I was just going over some ground rules and it turns out James and I were thinking quite alike because he actually made a slide. And uh, we're doing this because we want this to be good for the people in our class, especially those who have some hearing challenges, but we also want to make it good for the people that are watching us online. So I'm going to hand the microphone to James and he's going to go over these. And welcome again. Good morning. And so, um, wait a minute. I think we can have subtitles. Yeah, we can. All right, so the ground rules are, uh, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone before you begin to speak. This is a way that we can be respectful to online listeners. Uh, please wait until the speaker asks a question or ask, asks for comments before raising your hand. Agreeing with the information taught in the World Religion and New Thought class is not required. Let's stay away from lengthy debates during class. Teachers of this class work hard Putting, to, putting these classes together, please be respectful of their effort and time. I'm going to put this right here because it's a much better spot for it. Okay, so in this class, uh, I'm going to be talking about faith and belief and how they're, they interact with each other and uh, whether or not they're the same thing. But I wanted to start out with a uh, brief meditation. Um, it's a meditation that we're doing in the uh, Spirit Guides um, class that we're doing on Thursdays, and uh, it's just a daily meditation. Now, I kind of wanted to start out, too, asking the question, who has a daily spiritual practice? Yeah. And one of the things, uh, especially when we're talking about this topic, is um, one of the things that's really important is to have some kind of a daily practice, whether that's five minutes or an hour or three hours, which I don't think any of us here do that, but... A Course in Miracles says that just five minutes with the Holy Spirit every day can set your mind toward the thoughts of God for the entire day. And so that's why it is important to have a daily meditation or daily practice of some sort, because it does set the intention for um, our day. Is there a streaming issue? Oh, no, I just was checking. Oh, okay, yes, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, and then... Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Oh, and, and it doesn't have to be something long, and it doesn't have to be difficult, and it doesn't have to be super spiritual either. Um, and I think that that's important because we can just focus on the fruit of the Spirit. We can focus on love, which is what the meditation that we're going to do in class is all about, or joy, or peace, or patience. Whatever is relevant to us at that time, those are spiritual things that we can actively engage in. So I'll go ahead and play the meditation, and we'll just do this three-minute meditation together. A circle of love. See yourself standing in a very safe space. Release your burdens and pains and fears. Old negative addictions and patterns. See them falling away from you. Then see yourself standing in your safe place with your arms wide open saying I am open and receptive to declaring for yourself what it is you want not what you don't want but what you do want and know that it is possible See yourself whole and healthy, at peace. See yourself filled with love. All we need is one idea to change our lives. On this planet, we can be in a circle of hate, or we can be in a circle of love and healing. I choose to be in a circle of love. I realize that everyone wants the same things I want. 
We want to express ourselves creatively in ways that are fulfilling. We want to be peaceful and safe. And in this space, feel your connection with other people in the world. Let the love in you go from heart to heart. And as your love goes out, know that it comes back to you multiply. I send comforting thoughts to everyone and know that these thoughts are returning to me. See the world becoming an incredible circle of light. And so it is. So that was just three minutes. And can you just feel how much different just, just focusing our attention on love for three minutes can do and it, and it influences our entire day. And so this morning I started out my um, practice. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning, which is not common, but I was wide awake. So I decided to start my practice. And um, one, of, one of the things that I do in my practice is I pull an oracle card. And this morning, as I was shuffling the deck, two cards jumped out. And I was like, oh my goodness, I have to add this to my PowerPoint because they're so relevant to this topic. And the first one was believe in magic. And the second one was expecting miracles, which is the, the synopsis of everything that we're going to talk about today. And so I just want to start, we're going to talk about um, Charles Fillmore's definition of belief and what that means. He describes belief as an inner acceptance of an idea as true. Belief is closely related to faith. Belief functions both consciously and subconsciously. Many false individual and race beliefs are very active below the conscious level, meaning that we're not aware of them. To erase these hidden errors, beliefs, these hidden error beliefs, a comprehensive program of denial is necessary. Um, is everyone familiar with affirmations and denials? We're going to talk about them a little bit in class today, but um, yeah. So, and I, we don't have any uh, Abraham people in here because Abraham's definition of belief is uh, one of my favorite. Actually, Matt, do you know Abraham's definition of what a belief is? Uh, I forget it at the moment. Okay. So, that's fine. I just, I, I figured we'd have some Abraham people in here. I was like, no. Oh. Okay, but I will just go ahead and give it because it is one of my favorite definitions. A belief is only a thought that you keep thinking, and the only thing that keeps you from who you really are and what you really want is a belief, which is only a thought you keep thinking. And what does this mean with faith? Because they are interchangeable ideas. And so I wanted to uh, give you the revealing word what uh, Charles Fillmore says about faith. And he says, the perceiving power of the mind linked with the power to shape substance. Spiritual assurance, the power to, the power to do the seemingly impossible. It is a magnetic power that draws unto us uh, our heart's desires from the, ver from the invisible spiritual substance. Faith is a deep inner knowing that that which we that, that which is sought is already ours for the taking. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, Hebrews 11.1. 1. And the rest of that is an evidence of things not seen. And so faith is the activity of our beliefs. Faith is the power behind our beliefs. Does anybody have any comments or questions to that? I feel like we don't have very many talkers here today. <laughs> so are faith and belief the same thing? So beliefs are just the mental constructs we hold in our mind. 
They're just the stories or images that we choose to keep um, thinking or believing. Beliefs do influence faith. What we choose to believe does create our experience of life. Belief is the thought or idea that produces faith. Faith is the substance and energy behind the belief, a belief system. And different beliefs can result in the same kind of faith. This is why people from different religions can have the same type of spiritual experience, because the belief is just the, the foundation for the experience. This is why we have a world religion class, because we know that uh, it's not necessarily that having a belief, a specific belief, creates the faith, but we want to expand people's capacity to have faith. And so we share multiple different belief systems to help expand a person's capacity to have faith. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus actually uh, gave us a demonstration about how faith and belief are not the same thing. So in the stories within the Gospels, there was a time when a Roman centurion came to Jesus and asked for his servant to be healed. And a Roman centurion would have a completely different belief system than Jesus would have. Jesus was a Jew, a Jewish person, and he would, his whole mental construct surrounding spirituality would have been completely different than a Roman centurion. Yet Jesus said to the Roman centurion, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. So he was talking to a person who had completely di a completely different idea when it came to spiritual beliefs, and what the Roman centurion had said was, I... I'm a person of authority, and I know what authority looks like. And so he was basing his faith on, he recognized Jesus had authority. He recognized the Christ within Jesus. And it was his faith that allowed his servant to be healed. So that was an example that we don't have to have the same belief system to create the, the same type of faith. And what we're really talking about here is unity's third principle. Thoughts create our experiences. Humans create their experiences by the activity of their thinking. Everything in the manifested realm has its beginning in thought. So another way of saying that is every thought you think and word you speak is constantly shaping your world and the experiences that you're having. We are co-creators with God, creating reality through thoughts held in mind. Another way of saying that is the law of attraction, that we're always attracting the right people and the right circumstances that are a reflection of whatever state of consciousness that we're in. And we create life experiences through our way of thinking. Any comments? Okay. I was uh, just going to say one thing about um, when you were talking about the difference between beliefs and faith. I attended seminary um, back in 2012. Um, it was called All Faith Seminary International. And from that experience, as well as many other experiences in my life, having friends who were of different religious faiths, um, you know, I really got to see, you know, we might think differently. We might have different beliefs, but the thing that really had that golden thread that ties us all together is that faith. And, you know, you take someone of maybe Islamic faith, faith <laughs> and they're very strong in their beliefs, but what really tied it together for me was that we could carry the same type of faith. We loved God. <laughs> right. It was the basis of it. And love is the basis of that. So I, I kind of like to look at that as, I mean, that's why when we first started this class, you know, 
four, almost four years ago, I really wanted to tie in world religions because it is my belief <laughs> that um, 95% of what we're trying to accomplish through, quote, religion is the same thing in all religious faiths. And we may, you know, go about it differently, but it's that faith that does keep us all tied together. It's that glue that binds us, I believe. And I really think it's the same thing that's what's going on in our world, or even our country right now, politically speaking. You know, I think there's been forces that have wanted to kind of divide us, you know, and say, oh, you know, belief here, belief there. But really speaking, I think we, we mostly want the same thing. It's just that we have this incredible division that is out there that's trying to keep us separate anyway. Right. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I always kind of look at it as like the spokes on a wheel. You know, the closer you get to the center, the more each tradition looks the same, that there are similar, similar qualities to each tradition. So let's talk about manifestation, because that's a big topic. Faith, belief, and manifestation. It's always a big topic. And just in our discussion about the third principle, I don't know if anyone's ever noticed, but the third principle says that, or it, it notice that the third principle doesn't mention, or mentions only experiences, not conditions. And I think that that's one thing that we are often um, focused on, because, and it is our mind, that creates our experiences. And some people really don't like that concept because it sounds like you know we're responsible, we, which we are, but some people don't want that responsibility. Um, but I like Eric Butterworth's, oh, Eric Butterworth's uh, definition of responsibility. Eric Butterworth called it the ability to respond. It, responsibility is just claiming our own power. We're not going around reacting to the circumstances of life. Our experience is different. And there is a temptation to focus on conditions rather than experiences, and this creates a lot of frustration. I don't know, has anybody ever just focused on wanting to change conditions? Yeah. Once I get the right job and the right house and the right car and the right spouse, then I'll finally be happy. Here's the problem with that. Happiness is the experience. There's, there's something that comes before that because our mind creates our experiences. Reframing our experiences of life is a powerful way that we can enhance our mental atmosphere in creating the experience. So um, one of the best examples that I have, has, does anybody watch the news? A little bit. Yeah, I watch it a little bit, too. What are some beliefs about the news? Negative. <laughs> Negative. <laughs> Negative. Negative. So why, why would that be? Does anybody have a reason why they're negative? Yeah, I'll take it to the negative person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because they're constantly showing, you know, murders and... I see that a lot, I should say, on the news. So they're constantly showing negative things. Negative things, yeah. Does anybody have an idea of why that may be? Fear sells. Fear, yeah. yeah. Sensationalism sells. Yeah. Sensationalism, uh-huh. Any other thoughts? Well, opinion seems to predominate uh, what we call news. So that has a shaded approach to how we may see uh, whatever reality that means. Yeah. Ellen Cohen um, was, is a teacher of A Course in Miracles, and I love what he said about the news. He said, the news is the proctological examination of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Jane? Alan Cohen. He's oh, a teacher okay. of A Course in Miracles. Yeah, He's written several great. books. Yeah. And I, I really appreciated that. However, there was a time, I was, I was reading um, Emmett Fox, and he was talking about the news and the negativity of the news, and he said, but what if, what if the news is negative? 
because human humans themselves are so innately good, so innately pure, that the only thing we think of as newsworthy is something bad. That we don't see the good things as newsworthy because, we, because each individual is a spark of the divine. Wow. That's a way of reframing something. And that was very powerful to me because I had a very negative outlook on the news. And it is negative. I mean, you know, it, it is fear-based. It's negative. Uh, sensationalist. That, those are all true things. But then also the ability to reframe it like that for me was just like it changed my whole perspective. Yes. I was like, wow, yes. that's probably true. Feelings matter because these are our experiences of life. We experience our thinking patterns through our feelings. And this is why uh, focusing on conditions is usually not very beneficial to us <laughs> because sometimes our conditions are a result of many old patterns of thinking and many subconscious patterns of thinking and many things that are, you know, uh, a part of race consciousness, a part of you know things we were taught when we were younger as children. And so when we elevate our consciousness into what the Bible calls the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, when we elevate our consciousness to those experiences, that is our experience of life. And regardless of external circumstances, we still have a choice in how we experience reality. My mouse is gone. Uh oh. Oh, wait, did it go? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, we have a choice in how we think. And what, in Unity, what do we use? In, as the choice, what do we use to shift our thinking patterns? Our principles. Principles, yeah. These affirmations and denials, mm -hmm. yeah. And we can use denials for persistent negative thinking patterns. You know, whether it's just really simple, like this condition, this situation has no power over me. You know, that's what Myrtle Fillmore did, and we'll talk about that a little later, but. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just was reminded of like denying, I often, as I know I'm not the only one, criticize myself. In fact, I just wrote it in one of the Almon Daily Readers today, I believe, about, you know, the, that uh, this person had, their experience was that they had achieved not allowing other people to put them down, but they hadn't achieved in, in preventing themselves from putting themselves down. And I find myself calling myself stupid and, uh, you know, when I make a mistake, everybody makes mistakes, but, you know, it, it's real easy just to really dump on yourself. And uh, I, that's one of my goals for 2022 is to stop doing that as often. Oh, yeah. It's very detrimental. Yeah. Because what we believe about ourselves even, I mean, that, that shapes our world and our reality. Actually, we're going to talk about that with the next quote. James. No, I was going to say, I think uh, when we do what we enjoy, that it ties us to a higher source, so to speak, uh, whether that's uh, with our family or what we're doing or however that manifests, I think uh, that sense of mindfulness is really the key with how that works. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have to be aware of what we're thinking. I, and I think that that's one of the reasons why meditation, you know, is such a powerful tool, is because it puts us into awareness of what we're thinking. And a lot of times people think meditation is about that we stop thinking. Who has had that experience? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, who can just sit there for hours and just not think anything? Fall asleep. I, right. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you fall asleep, but then your subconscious mind is still pretty active. Yeah. Yeah, to me, meditation, you know, I do experience gaps of silence, but to yes. me, meditation is being more just observant yeah. to what's going on, you know, and paying attention. It's like, oh, there's a joy thought. Not holding on to it, but just letting it pass through and like, oh, look, that's a disaster. 
and you just let it go, you know, like, let it fade into the, dis the distance. The administration. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we've just become more aware. And, be, and when we're more aware, then we have, can actively um, participate in the process of using affirmations and denials. Cause, because if we have a consistent thought, if we're meditating, and every time we meditate, we have this consistent negative thought, we know what to deal with. And I think that that's one of the reasons why meditation is so powerful. Because if we don't meditate, we really don't know. Yeah. You know, we have, we have yeah. layers upon layers of thoughts that are just keep pushing through, pushing through. And then we wonder why we experience such challenges in life. And it's, sometimes it's just taking a step back. But I would not, you know, I, some people, actually, some people uh, <laughs> say that it's difficult to meditate. And it's really just sitting there and allowing yourself to pay attention to what's going on in your mind. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to call you out. I yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just had that conversation. We literally just Thursday had night, we just had that conversation. <laughs> okay, so one of my teachers is Louise Hay. And she says every thought that we think, uh, it, everything that we experience is only, in life is only a thought, and a thought can be changed. Everything, it doesn't matter what you're experiencing, yeah. it's just a thinking pattern. Even if you're having a so-called negative experience, it's just the story you're telling of yourself about the experience. You're giving a narration to the experience that is negative. And she also says what we believe about ourselves or about life becomes true for us. And if you really think about it, even self-hatred is just hating a thought we're thinking about ourselves. That's all that it is. Banish the thought. Banish the thought. Does anybody have any comments to that? Well, I, I would like to comment a little bit about your ideas of meditation. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think mindfulness is a 24-7 thing. Right. And I, I think that you don't, after 30 years of this, I don't think you need to sit in some sense of silence because it's uniformly who you are and what you do. I think that's the reason why I enjoy nature and flowers and growing, growing things so much because you can see the impermanence of things. You can see starting by seed, it's the whole story, starting things by seed, helping it grow and nurture, uh, and then uh, putting it on the yard, and that to me is the most incredible mm -hmm. sense of meditation, uh, being out in nature oh, yeah. and, and, and planting things and watching them grow. And then in the fall, uh, before the freeze or whatever, you cut them back, uh, knowing they will return mm -hmm. uh, for perennials. Uh, and you, I think that's the key for me the whole idea of mindfulness and meditation is it's not simply a matter of sitting, even though sitting in silence is important uh, to clear the air, so to speak. So you can really have a sense of what is, what is now and how do I relate to that and who am I as it relates to that. But I think that, that I think what you're saying as far as what Louise Hay uh, trying to talk about uh, for people was the idea of believing in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest takeaway uh, for me uh, for what uh, Louise was talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I, I personally find it useful to have a daily um, practice, where even if it's just me sitting there for five minutes. You know, I, when we started, I, I mentioned something that A Course in Miracles says, that five minutes a day with the Holy Spirit is enough to set your thinking patterns toward the divine for the rest of the day. And so I do think that having some sort of consistency is important, but you're right. The whole, I mean, this mindfulness is something that we do in all moments of our life, that we can do in all moments of our life. We can pay attention in all moments of our life. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just recently was, um, well, I've tried to adopt, actually it's been a few months now, of meditating, daily meditation the first thing in the morning, and it helps me to purpose my day to focus on 
the good and the, to try to, to be the best that I can be. But I also concur, is it Dan? In terms of, I can recall many times, like, because I, I had a I really struggle with meditation because I, again, had that belief that I had to excise all thinking, all my thoughts. But so, so I really like your, your, your analogy, of how, or excuse me, your description of how you don't have to do that. But I, I started to say I'd agree with Dan in terms of many times before I ever did any meditation, I, I realized now that I was doing meditation when I got out in nature. Mm -hmm. And as I was walking in the woods and being hearing the sound, one of the most beautiful noises in, to me in the world is the sound of a stream. And the quietness and, uh, and the, just the shadows and the dappling of the sun in the, in the forest. I, I just love that. Well, just as kind of a plug for my program next month, <laughs> uh, uh, the idea of establishing a place, having a sense of, aware of, of who you are through what the environment you create around you. Because in order to really begin to have a sense of, of meditation or what that means, you have to know who you are. Right. You have to know what your aspirations are. And, and I think we do that, at least for me, is establishing that sense of identity, that sense of place. And through that, we establish our purpose. It's, it's hard for me many times to think of people who um, have real difficulties because they don't have a sense of self mm -hmm. and they don't have that sense of identity as to who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest weakness. And, I, and for me, unity is the, one of its greatest strengths is it helps us to identify what that is. And before you know who that is, it's really hard, but that having a sense of place and focus where you can you can just become who you are, I think is is really the essential first step. So when you mean place, do you mean like a physical place? Physical place. Yeah. Um, the fourth slide I had on here with the two oracle cards that I pulled. This is, this is on my altar, which is a lot bigger. This is just where I put the two cards, or what, usually one card, but two came out this morning, about belief and about miracles. And, um, but yeah, I totally agree. Having some sort of sacred space for yourself, and it doesn't, I mean, I have several. I you know over by where I live, I have a garden that I walk through. There's a, a labyrinth that I walk through. Those are sacred places for me, too, that I use when it's not freezing cold. But when it's freezing cold, I also have my altar. And uh, that's where, you know, my daily practice exists is in, in that uh, space. So, yeah, I totally agree. And if you don't have a sacred space, find one and consistently go there because it does enhance our um, journey within. Mine's my recliner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in uh, about finding ourselves, right before um, we started, I was playing some music, and this song, uh, I'm Not Who You Think I Am, came on. It's one of my favorite songs already, but the lyrics are, I'm not who you think I am. I am so much more. I am one with source. I am limitless, infinite, powerful, abundant, creator of all. I am. Wow. And it's just, and just even saying that, I feel that energy of that. Um, that is FIA. F-I-A, FIA. Okay. Yep. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah, it, it really is. I love her music. I mean, sometimes she says the F-bomb. If you can't handle that, it's probably not for you. <laughs> but um, she says it in the context of who we are in our spiritual development. There's actually a... Um, uh, Zen practice called effort therapy, <laughs> and it really oh Matt's not here, but it really helped Matt kind of get oh, into yeah. his center. Yeah. And so yeah, I can't remember the author if that. I was going to ask him, but I don't see him. So all right, so we were talking about Louise Hay. So oh, what I was going to say is, where do these beliefs come from? These more challenging beliefs, and we talked, we mentioned race mind, but what it, you know, does anybody have any thoughts or ideas on 
where do these negative things come from? If we're pure, positive light, if we are I am, where do they come from? Yeah, go ahead. ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Yep, yeah, a lot of them do, absolutely. So, um, has anybody heard of the science of memetics? Okay, have you heard of a meme? Yes, sure. I, I use memes every day for Unity. Yes. And I'm gonna plug them right now. If you have a Facebook page, please go on the Facebook page and share. You don't have to share all of them, yeah. but share the ones that you really like. Some of mine, you wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to see that. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, from the Facebook page, there's a share button. And, I, and, if, and if you would just share them, because how memes work is that they're thought forms that spread. And so when we see, like a virus. Actually, the memes, the word meme means thought virus. That's great. I never heard of that. Yeah, there's actually a really good book. Um, Virus of the Mind, and it's it's a science book about uh, about sociology and about memetics and how memetics work. Um, so I'll just give you the definitions. Memetic and memes are scientific words to describe thoughts passing through groups and societies like viruses. And this is why it's important to share the positive stuff on social media, because we want that to be spread like a virus. Yeah, go ahead. Well, one of the things about creating a space is uh, is the fl and the flow of energy, and what you're talking about directly is that flow is universal, and how we connect with that, uh, and it's it's eternal. Mm -hmm. So it's it unfortunately goes both ways. There's both positive things in the universe that we try to connect with. But there's also negative things that are trying to butt in and find a place as well. Yeah. So that's that's really the key. But it's that flow of energy that is so central to uh, connecting to what lies beyond ourselves. Yeah, it's like the Platonic realm of ideals. So, like we're talking about meditation. If your focused thought is on love. What's really happening is you're tapping into the energy behind love. You're connecting with every human being on the planet that has that mindset at that moment. Same way with, with peace. If we are focused on peace, we're connecting to the energy of peace along with everyone else who's focused on peace at that moment. But if you're connecting to frustration, anger, resentment, guilt, blame, criticism, judgment, desire for vengeance, jealousy, you're also connecting to that energy on the planet as well. Go ahead. I can, I can think of a perfect example of that that I, that I witnessed and observed in, in my youth, and it was when um, John and Yoko did that, uh, basically, um, lay in for peace or whatever, it is. I forgot what it was called now, but they connected to that yeah. worldwide, and it actually did help foment peace in, a, in many countries across the world. And I don't think anybody had ever really locked into that understanding that the, of what you were just saying about a, a desire for something is universal. To, like what, what Dan was saying about the about that flow of energy, it's so real, and so many of us are disconnected from it. Right. Well, by, well we're all connected to it. Yes, but we yeah. are disconnected because we don't pay any attention to right. it. Right. It's about conscious. It's about elevating consciousness. Uh, many unity churches across the country have what is called a unity pole that they have adjacent to the church on the church grounds. It generally stands about six feet tall and is four-sided and has in different languages. And I believe it is called a peace pole. Yeah. And it is something that unity, uh, it's a, it, emblematic of uh, the spirit uh, that unity tries to project. And I know when I was a member in, in South Florida, our unity church had one. And uh, other churches I've been to, 
uh, have have this have this as well. I don't know if we've just never looked at it or thought about it or whatever. Uh, but anyway, it's that connection. It's interesting. Is that just a unity thing? Because I didn't think it was because there's one uh, in Ludington, and we don't have a unity church back where I lived in Michigan. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, whether it was just a unity thing or yeah. not, I don't know. Oh, I was just curious. I always like to know where but things come from. <laughs> it's a lovely thing to, to support. Yeah. So Merriam-Webster uh, defines memetics as the study of meme. Memetics sees ideas as a kind of virus, something uh, sometimes propagating in spite of truth and logic. Its maxim is beliefs that survive aren't necessarily true. Rules that survive aren't necessarily a rule. Wait, I lost my spot. Just a second. <laughs> Beliefs that survive aren't necessarily true. Rules that survive aren't necessarily fair. And rituals that survive aren't necessarily necessary. <laughs> and so I actually have a really good example of how a meme can work in a person's life. And it was when I was working with one of my clients. And she was having a really difficult time in relationships. And she had probably 15, went through 15 different people in, a, you know, like an wow. eight-year time span. And she, and she was so frustrated. And in the conversation, she said, you know, it's just that all of the good men are gay oh. Oh. or married. Wow. Wow. That's sad. And I was like, well, what are you, what are you leaving space for? Yes. <laughs> You're leaving space for terrible people to come yes. into your life. Yes. That's the only, because, I mean, she knew a lot of really wonderful gay people and a lot of really wonderful married men. <laughs> and come to find out... Her mother divorced her father when she was very young, never remarried, and constantly said all of the good wow. men are married or gay. And she just adopted that yes. as truth. And that's how memes work. Yes. And I'm sure her saying that, she got some of her friends to start saying it. Yes. And she, that's what a meme is. It's a thought pattern that spreads. So does anybody have any other examples of uh, memes? Like common negative or positive ones? Trailer park, the mobile home park that I'm in right now is they moved um, four mobile homes in there recently and the mobile home co the, the company that was building the mobile homes in there the driver and the uh, white car people they were for black men. And one of the contractors, helpers out there said, how, he said, I had a very bad opinion of black people until they uh, pulled them in there and they, and they got them trailers in there and put them exactly where they wanted them without very little effort. So that changes perspective mm -hmm. of white people. Yeah, and that's, I mean, racism can definitely be a memetic issue. Yeah. And, and it also is associated with race mind and race consciousness right. as well. Go ahead. Uh, reading materials and what we teach our kids is a real challenge because this current effort right now underway all over the, all over the country uh, to limit <laughs> the books, yeah. to limit what kids can read, to limit their thinking, to limit their ability to think critically uh, of different philosophical ideas or different ways of thinking things, I think is a real, uh, not only challenge, but a real threat. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't allow children in an educational environment to view alternate points of view, then they are not really learning. They can't think critically. And that is, that is going to be with us uh, going forward, I'm afraid, for, uh, for a while.
Okay, uh, the example of a meme that just came to me that's probably one of the most heinous that I can think of. I don't know if y'all are aware of uh, a thing called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now, what that is, that's been around for at least 100 years or maybe quite longer. I can't remember when it, exactly it, that it started, but um, the first time I ever was exposed to it, I got a flyer from a racist. He was the guy that ended up shooting the people at the synagogue up in Kansas City, and he was from Aurora, actually. And he, had years before that, had been involved in trying to foment hate and and he had this newsletter that he would send out and just distribute and I found it in my mailbox and it had that protocol in there and I was just aghast because what it says is that all Jews are evil and of the devil if it, essentially and that not it goes further it says that they kill and eat babies and this is something that even it seems astounding to us that people would even accept or believe that nonetheless it has continued to pro proliferate I learned about it in my history class about the uh, about um, the Jews and the and the Holocaust I took a class about the Holocaust and they were talking specifically about that and how damaging that is and another good example is the thing about the the, the uh, people who Oh, you know the got the Pizza Gate thing. The yeah, you know, I won't yeah. go any further. So there's yeah, there's a, there's a lot of negative ones for sure. Oh, so like money doesn't grow on trees. Yeah, I had that one listed. <laughs> that was yeah, that one was a big one in my family. And that, and that as you age, you're gonna get sick, mm -hmm. or even like you know people who are diagnosed with terminal illnesses. Mm -hmm. You know that's a meme that you have to die from this illness. Yeah. Um, but true. I have to think of some positive ones. Um, Let's just create positive. I guess I Everything have is positive working ones, out you know? for my highest good. Yeah, like only good lies before me. Yes. The government uh, that serves me serves with love yes. and honesty and truth. We can send out memes. Exactly. We can create these things. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did want to just make a comment here too. Up close. I, I think that uh, all propaganda is, you know, has that meme behind it oh, sure. that we're you know we're trying to create a reality or you know we're putting out a reality that is often and most of the time not true but I also wanted to say one thing you know when you were talking about um, was it your mother that was talking or somebody's mother that was talking about or that um, about the men about the men oh yeah it was yeah. one of my clients and I, I do want to throw something out here because if men were to say something like that about women, they, we would be jumped on immediately. <laughs> but I've, I've seen it said here in church. I've seen it well, from, seen it our, here, from our women in church that put stuff on Facebook about how there are just no good men. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they actually believe it. Well, I, I mean, I'm talking, to, I'm talking to people here that actually believe that. So they probably experience it, too. Exactly. They probably yeah. experience yeah. it, too. And it's sad. It's sad yes. to see that. Anyway. Right. Let's see. How are we on time? Okay. I have a few more slides. So um, Wayne Dyer said, uh, in, in speaking of Richard Brody, that's the, the author's name of the book, Virus of the Mind, which is a very great book about how memes get spread through societies and such. He said, Wayne Dyer said, a mind virus is different in that there is no form in it. These are ideas placed in our heads when we are little, we get programmed by well-meaning people like our parents and their parents, our culture, religions, and schools. We get conditioned to believe in our limitations and what's not possible. I'm actually going to skip over this, Charles Fulmore, because we kind of already talked about race consciousness. Um, just briefly, race consciousness is just the old thought patterns like uh, that, that have existed in the collective consciousness about things like sickness, disease, um, politics can have a lot of race consciousness in it. But let's talk about the solutions. Oh, and I wanted to mention the placebo effect. So um, we actually have a lot of scientific evidence that shows that beliefs can have a powerful impact on both our physical body and our experiences. 
In fact, according to psycho psychology today, the placebo effect can have as much as a 72% effective rate, curative rate. That's huge. That's huge. I, I uh, you know, sometimes I like talking to people about stuff like this, and so many people just think that that's new age woo woo stuff. And it, you know, it's it's very interesting to me. Because it's, you know, the placebo effect shows that our physical bodies do respond to our thinking patterns. But I always think, too, that, you know, obviously, these people that believe this, they must have, they've never had a, a sexual fantasy in their life. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously, it yes. really does have yes. an impact on our physiology. Yep. Okay, so. <laughs> That's a good example. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the, the, mind can, uh, the mind has a profound impact on our physical body. That's just, we know that to be fact now. So we're in a movement called New Thought. And what New Thought's all about is mental imagery can ha oh, oh, wait. I forgot to, okay, so wait. The yellow rose, I did want to, this is supposed to say yellow rose. But mental imagery can have a powerful influence on our experiences as well. We can have a switch to image, and especially if we practice this a lot, if we're in a state of fear or worry and we have a switch to image in our mind, we can switch to that to calm ourselves down. And so uh, Louise Hayes was a yellow rose. Mine is actually a blue butterfly. And if you don't have one or you've never heard of this, I highly recommend it because when we utilize our imagination, we open ourselves up to the possibilities of life because that's where our creativity comes from. But I did want to mention uh, this quote from Healing Letters by Myrtle Fillmore. Any thought that is not based on the eternal reality, truth has no ex ex that truth has no existence. If we believe in disease, we are believing in something that has no substance or reality. So even if we're thinking about politics, or we're thinking about you know we we engage with uh, the vulnerable community for a reason, because we are engaging in that higher reality that everything is provided. And one of the things I love about volunteering is filling up the cart and making it full. Yes. <laughs> yes. Really full. Yes. And I actually, I really like it if somebody comes up to me and says, oh, that person got three things of hot chocolate. And I'm like, let me go grab some. Yes. <laughs> it is so fun to demonstrate yes. abundance. Oh, yeah. When we dissolve the belief out of our minds and it, in its place establish a realization of the one presence and one power of good and ex exercise our faith in health as we are as the one presence and one power within us we shall feel the conviction that we are the expression of health that is god or that god is so that's what yeah go ahead just very very quickly i think the real one of the real challenge is when we the sense of unworthiness mm -hmm. of others that seems to permeate so many in our society that they they think that other people are not worthy for whatever reason, uh, and I think that is that is one of the bigger weaknesses we have as a culture, is the sense of unworthiness. Mm -hmm. One of the best examples is what's happened in Jefferson City now, uh, where they're trying to take Medicare away, even though the Supreme Court said that they had to do it. And they're coming back and saying, no, we, we need to means test yeah. these people because they're not worthy. Yeah. Yes. Very yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And, yeah. And one of the things that I do recommend is sending love to the government yes. every day. Yes. You know, in a firm. Yes. Uh, you know, the government supports everyone. The government is motivated by love. Yep. The government, the people that are in the government are trustworthy, upstanding. And here's the thing with an affirmation. When you start using it, it certainly does not feel true. Right. <laughs> if it were already true, you wouldn't need an affirmation. Good point. Yeah. Uh, that's funny that you should mention that because I was going to pass along as the meme, um, the old saying, we're from the government and we're here to help you. <laughs> and, you know, I used to use that as sarcastic, but now I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. They really are here to help yes. us. Let's do what we can, pay our taxes, get this thing going, get all these bridges and everything else fixed before more people are killed. 
So, and here's the thing. I, I have a feeling that even the people who are creating negativity through our government, they feel like they're doing the right oh, thing. They, absolutely. Yeah. They yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we certainly do. Um, yeah. Well, we all want the world and other people to change. We all want it to change. But the only thing we can ever change is ourselves. But here's the thing. If we start changing ourselves, that has a ripple effect. Yes. People see our example. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, um, I was talking about generosity with one of our guests and how what we put out comes back. And, the, and immediately, somebody needed a notebook and he says, just a second, I've got, some, I've got one. And he pulled it out and he gave it away. And you better believe that will come back to him. Yes. And it will come back multiplied yes. because it, it works like a seed. Yes. You know, if you plant a tomato seed in the ground... Yes. You're going to get a lot more seeds yeah. from that one seed. You're going to get a lot of tomatoes, and each one of them is going to have hundreds yeah. of seeds. That's how it works. Yeah. Well, and so as we perpetuate love and joy and peace in our, in our own consciousness, that has a ripple effect as well. Woohoo! Amen. Yeah. All right. All right, so we're new thought, and we're almost out of time, but I'll go really quick, I promise. So do we have the announcements too? Yes. Okay, good. All right, our movement is called New Thought because we practice the process of changing, of changing, shifting old thinking patterns, changing or shifting, old thinking patterns into new ones. We raise our consciousness above race consciousness. We raise our consciousness above the memetics that are currently in our system. And the more we do that, the more we spread that, the more other people start adopting those and it uh, just becomes a, you know, uh, yeah. New Thought teaches that we are not bound by race consciousness or mimetic influences. We can choose beliefs that support us. And so just in closing, can you hand those out? And as she's handing those out, I'm going to do the announcements, but then we're going to say some positive statements together. So Matt Weaving continues on Thursday, 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. Our amazing uh, bag angels and weavers are getting close to their goal of 100 lightweight mats that protect the unsheltered from the weather. Reports are that these are truly life-saving. New volunteers are always welcome. They will train you. Okay. Thursdays at 6.30 is calling your divine support system group led by me. Uh, these are, um, yeah, they are using the book Ask Your Guides by Sonia Choquette. It's a great book. Uh, next week's New Thought and World Religion class will be taught by Amy Burnett on the book, on the book of Forgiving by Desmond and, oh, how do you say... <laughs> Mafo Tutu? Yes, that's that. it. Yeah. Okay. Discussing the fourfold uh, path for healing ourselves and our world. That sounds phenomenal. That's a good follow up for this talk. And we want to announce that we have a new junior Sunday school director. We do. We have a new. <laughs> we have a new junior Sunday school uh, instructor director. Uh, Jen Jones. Okay, and then we're, let's let's say these oh, let's say these final affirmations t together. Examples of new. Sorry, I went way back. Yeah. Just a second. Okay. I am always safe. Everything I need to know is revealed to me. Everything I need comes in perfect time, in the right time and space. See sequence. Life is a joy and filled with love. I prosper everywhere I turn. I am willing to change and grow. All is well in my world. And so it is. And so it is. Yes.